Committee on Science, Space, and Technology will come to order. With that objection, the chair is authorized to declare recesses of the committee at any time. And pursuant to Committee Rule 2E, House Rule 112H4, the committee announces that he may postpone roll call votes. Pursuant to notice, I now call up H.R. 2039, the NASA Authorization Act of Fiscal Year 2016 and Fiscal Year 2017. And the clerk will report the bill. H.R. 2309, a bill to authorize the programs of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration and for other purposes. Be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled, Section 1, short title. With that objection, the bill is considered as read and open for amendment at any point. And I'll recognize myself for an opening statement and then the uh, ranking member. Uh, good morning to all. Uh, today we mark up H.R. 2039, the NASA Authorization Act for 2016 and 2017. There is a reason why the National Air and Space Museum is the most visited museum in America. Space exploration captures the imagination of people around the world and encourages future generations to dream big, work hard, and shoot for the stars. NASA has accomplished some of the most awe-inspiring and technologically advanced feats in the history of humankind. Throughout its history, our space program has set goals that required vision and offered challenges that have led to innovation and the development of new technologies. New technologies enable new discoveries about the universe and give us hope that we can find solutions to problems here on Earth. Space exploration is an investment in our nation's future, often the distant future, and many technologies that Americans use on a daily basis were born out of NASA research. These include heart rate monitors, athletic shoes, air and water purifiers, cordless tools, and laptop computers. Other space spin-offs include GPS, high-definition TV, and laser surgery. These all improve Americans' quality of life and save lives. Today's bill is a step in the right direction to ensure that NASA will continue to innovate and inspire. The scientists, engineers, and astronauts who find creative and new solutions to the challenges of exploring the universe serve as role models for our students. They motivate young people to study science, math, engineering, and computer science. The authorization levels for fiscal year 16 and 17 included in this bill provide NASA with the resources necessary to remain a leader in space exploration in a time of tight budget realities. Unlike the President's budget request, this NASA authorization complies with the Budget Control Act. The bill allows for additional funding support only if it is budget neutral and corresponding offsets are identified. The bill funds NASA at its top-line request of $18.5 billion for fiscal year 16 and $18.8 .8 billion for fiscal year 17, while including necessary additional resources for national priorities such as the Space Launch System and Orion. It also establishes a balance between the exploration and science accounts by funding both equally at $4.95 billion. The bill also balances funding across all the science divisions. It increases funding for the James Webb Space Telescope to enable it to stay on track. And it increases funding for astrophysics and heliophysics to study our universe and our sun. The bill increases funding for commercial crew by $438 million, the International Space Station by $123 million, exploration research and development by $68 million, safety, security, and mission support, which funds center operations by $84 million, and construction and environmental cleanup by $53 million. Overall, the bill provides $30 million more than the President's request. For 50 years, the U.S. has led the world in space exploration. We must ensure that the U.S. continues to lead this in space for the next 50 years. And we must continue to invest in NASA as the only American agency responsible for space exploration. I encourage all members to vote for this bill and now recognize the ranking member, the gentlewoman from Texas, uh, Ms. Johnson, for her comments. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Just a little over two months ago, we marked up and passed out of the House a bipartisan NASA authorization. That bill was negotiated on a bipartisan basis and voice voted out of the committee and out of the House. 
Apparently, the majority doesn't like to proceed with that much efficiency and bipartisanship because here we are, just two months later, with a completely different approach. The bill before us today wasn't pre-negotiated with the minority. In fact, nobody on our side had even seen the bill until the markup notice last Friday. Moreover, we didn't even find out about the majority's intentions to hold a NASA markup this week until the day the markup was noticed. So after we saw the bill, we understand why. In contrast to the bipartisan bill from February, H.R. 2039 abandons the tradition, the tradition of a well-balanced NASA portfolio in pursuit of ideologically driven cuts to programs the majority doesn't like. Most significantly, the majority's bill cuts earth science by over $320 million. Earth science, of course, includes climate science. It should come as no surprise that the majority wants to cut funding for a field of science where they are scared of the answers that the scientists give. Remember just last week, every single Republican member of this committee voted against the notion that climate change might be caused by people. In January, NASA announced that 2014 was likely the warmest year since 1880. NASA also noted that nine of the ten warmest years have occurred since year 2000. Of course, these scientific findings did not sit well with many of my Republican colleagues who have been consistently insisting of late that global warming is over. Instead of admitting that they might be wrong, the majority is doing the next best thing, cutting the budget of the scientists who keep making them look foolish. This is an embarrassment and does a profound disservice to the once proud reputation of this committee. The majority also cuts the aeronautics budget by $80 million, which is consistent with the President's request. I must say that for the life of me, I can understand why even uh, either the majority or the President, for that matter, is proposing to cut this account. The last time I checked, aviation equipment is one of the last major positive contributions to our trade balance that America still has. We are the world's leader in both commercial and military aviation equipment. But this leadership is in jeopardy as other major world powers focus their industrial efforts uh, on this sector. This is not the time to turn our backs on aeronautics research. This research will help to keep our aviation industry the world's leader and improve the quality of life of our citizens. Mr. Chairman, these are ill-advised cuts. These cuts have absolutely nothing to do with making America safer or stronger. Absolutely nothing. They are simply the expression of the majority stick to your head in the sand ideology. This is especially disappointing because we have worked so hard just three months ago to make our NASA authorization a bipartisan bill which could be broadly supported by the aerial space and science community. It is a shame to be throwing all that work away in pursuit of a narrow ideological agenda. I'm going to close with a warning. There are those in this country and in this Congress who don't think NASA should be a priority. NASA has survived and thrived over the years only because of the strong bipartisan backing of those who understand the importance of NASA to our national well-being. This bill before us will never become law because the majority's willingness to walk away from the bipartisanship in order to appease their own most ideologically driven members risk eroding support for NASA in general. <clears throat> this, I fear, will be one of the most unfortunate consequences of the majority's actions. Before I yield back, I'd like to place some letters and statements into the record from organizations that have echoed concerns about the bill, right. including the American Institute of Aeronautics and Aer Aeronautics. 
aeronautics and astronautics, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Geophysical Union, Geological Society of America, the Association of American Universities, the American Astronomical Society, University Space Research Association, and the Planetary Society. I thank you and yield back. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. With that objection, uh, the items you mentioned will be made a part of the record. Uh, the sponsor of the bill, uh, Mr. Palazzo of Mississippi, has arrived, and we look forward to his statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. H.R. 2039, the NASA author authorization for 2016 and 2017, provides policy provisions that passed the House of Representatives earlier this year by unanimous consent, but will await action by the Senate. This is the same bill that also passed the House last year by a vote of 401 to 2. This authorization preserves the bipartisan agreement on policy provisions and updates it to authorize funding levels for fiscal year 16 and fiscal year 17. Unlike the President's budget request, this bill fully complies with the Budget Control Act and provides for increased authorizations in the event that the BCA is repealed, replaced, or amended, or if offsets are identified within existing discretionary spending accounts to allow for increases. Fiscal year 16 and fiscal year 17 authorizations are aspirational levels that match the President's budget request top line for NASA and readjust sub-account levels to align with national priorities and return balance to the entire agency. Fiscal year 17 is a 1.5 percent increase for inflation in line with the President's request. If BCA relief or offsets are not found, then authorizations are limited to constrained levels. Aspirational levels create a balanced portfolio between exploration and science, $4.95 billion each. The bill also returns balance to the Science Mission Directorate by funding $1.5 billion for Earth science and $1.5 billion for planetary science, and $2 billion total for astrophysics, the James Webb Space Telescope, and heliophysics. The bill fully funds the Space Launch System and Orion Crew Vehicle under both the aspirational and constrained authorization levels and accelerates the development of SLS and Orion in fiscal year 17 under the aspirational level. This will give NASA time to plan for the accelerated development since we are just six months away from the beginning of the 2016 fiscal year. Also, the bill fully funds the commercial crew program under the aspirational level and increases funding under even the constrained level by $331 million. Because of the protest of a contract award last fall, NASA will have to delay milestones for the program. So it is possible that even this level of funding will be sufficient to ensure that Americans can once again launch American astronauts on American rockets from American soil by 2017. I know many of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle don't think that the Budget Control Act and sequestration restricts authorization committees. By this logic, no authorizing committee would need to adhere to the Budget Control Act. Thus, authorizers would simply provide an uncapped, unfunded wish list to appropriators. I can tell you that authorizing funding above what can be appropriated is a damaging act. It sets NASA up for failure by presenting the Space Agency with unfunded mandates. A long list of NASA advisory groups and Blue Ribbon Commissions have noted that NASA is being asked to do too much with too little. Authorizing committees should not contribute to the problem. This bill keeps the bipartisan agreement with the minority on policy provisions. This bill is also fiscally responsible. The bill balances exploration and science and restores true balance to the science division. Unlike the President's budget request, it provides for increased funding for NASA and makes sure those increases are paid for. I urge my colleagues to support this bill and join me in protecting America's legacy of leadership in space. I thank, yield back. Thank you, Mr. Palazzo. And the gentlewoman from Maryland, Ms. Edwards, the uh, ranking member of the Space Subcommittee, is recognized for her statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, quite frankly, at this point, I don't really understand what it means to be a ranking member or a chairman of a subcommittee on a committee that chooses to hold, hold a full committee markup on a bill that has never seen the light of day in the subcommittee. But here we are. So we're holding a full committee markup of the NASA Authorization Act of 2016 and 2017. It's a bill that our staff received just a, a week ago for a markup that came as a complete surprise and quite frankly um, professionally as an offensive uh, surprise given that almost a year ago to the day, April 29, 2014, we passed out a full committee of bipartisan NASA Authorization Act 
in 2015. And then um, just a short couple of months ago, uh, we did the same thing on a bipartisan basis. And there is nothing bipartisan about what is happening today. And that's a shame for the agency. It's a shame for the industry. It's a shame for the researchers and scientists all across this country. And it's a shame for uh, the United States preeminence in space. I was proud of the collaborative and bipartisan uh, process that we engaged in uh, previously. Uh, and that is why, frankly, I am just so disappointed and appalled today that we just learned of a markup and we are not going to par pass anything that even smells bipartisan. And so now that we're moving forward with this very hastily called full committee markup, I actually don't understand the, the haste, uh, frankly. I'm left to question the desire that I thought that we shared on this committee for our work, our continued work in a bipartisan fashion. Uh, very specifically, the bill cuts the pr uh, proposes to gut the earth science uh, program with proposed cuts of a half billion dollars for each of fiscal year 2016 and 2017 from the President's budget re request, which translates to cuts of hundreds of millions of dollars below the level appropriated for FY 2015. It's an action that not, would, would not only devastate NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, which is in the county that I live in, in Prince George's County in Maryland, it's going to result in the loss of many skilled jobs, not just in Maryland, but um, in other parts of the country. It would also cripple a research program that's vital to understanding our Earth and its environment, uh, despite the ideological disagreements um, that the majority seems to possess. Um, the bill also proposes to cut, um, proposes authorizations for space technology that are well below those directed in the President's budget request, and it cuts the funding for aeronautics to a level of $80 million below the fiscal year 2015 level. Mr. Chairman, you call the cuts and transfers made in this bill rebalancing. I call it a travesty, as I've said, for the industry and for the uh, agency. Uh, let me remind my colleagues that the committee didn't hold one single hearing, not one, on NASA's Earth Science Program during the entire 113th Congress, nor has it held or proposed to hold one single hearing on Earth Science during the 114th Congress. But I guess that is consistent with the work of this committee to engage in policy making without engaging in any inquiry. Uh, proposing to drastically reduce Earth science funding without any review of the rationale or impacts of doing so is a perpetuation of the majority's attempt to legislate without following either regular order. I mean, that's procedural, um, but worse, not following the advice of the scientific uh, community. Mr. Chairman, in your press release announcing this markup, you very shockingly mentioned heroes like Sally Ride, and yet what this bill does is an anathema to what Dr. Ride recommended in her 1987 report quote, NASA leadership in America's future in space, the RIDE report. And I want to quote from that report. She said, NASA, with its technical and scientific expertise, is uniquely suited to lead mission to planet Earth. Only from Earth orbit can we gain the perspective necessary to observe the Earth system and the interaction of its components on a global scale. The resulting Earth system models developed and refined over years of study are the important products of this initiative and would enable NASA uh, would, it, would establish NASA as a responsive agency ready to meet the challenge of a genuine time critical need. Championing this initiative would establish the United States at the forefront of a world recognized need to understand our changing planet. Mr. Chairman, we know that both NASA uh, lacks the resources it needs to accomplish all of this, these inspiring programs and that we have to undertake. And I want to just underscore in conclusion that including the University of Texas at Austin, the University of Virginia, Georgia Institute of Technology, numerous of the California, University of California systems among those who oppose uh, this authorization. And so shame, shame, shame on us. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. And we will now go to our list of amendments that are in the order they are listed on the roster. And the uh, ranking member, Ms. Johnson, is recognized to offer an amendment in the nature of a substitute. Thank you very much. I have an amendment at the desk. And the clerk will, re the clerk will report the amendment. 
Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2039, offered by Ms. Johnson of Texas. Strike all after the enacting clause and insert the following. Section 1, short title, table of contents, subsection A. With short title. objection, the amendment will be considered as read. The gentlewoman is recognized to explain her amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. This amendment is drawn largely from the majority's bill, which itself is drawn largely from the bipartisan NASA authorization of 2015 that passed the House earlier this year by voice vote. The primary difference is that my amendment will put NASA on a sustainable growth path to allow the agency to fulfill all of its important missions. When the Augustine Commission issued its report on the future of human space flight in 2009, they noted that NASA would need significant budget increases to support any human exploration program beyond Earth orbit. Whether that meant the moon or Mars or some other intermediate destination, the last NASA authorization to become law attempted to provide the agency with a sustained growth path to enable these missions. Unfortunately, the funding aspirations constrained in this bill were never achieved, and NASA is struggling to fulfill all of the missions it is tasked with under constrained funding. The majority's answer to this problem is to rob Peter and pay Paul. I reject that. I reject the notion that in order to send people to Mars, we have to stop trying to understand the planet we live on. From the very first days of America's space program, NASA has sought to better understand our planet Earth, in addition to the far reaches of space. The first American satellite launched into space discovered the Van Allen radiation belts surrounding our planet. It was a major scientific discovery, and it presaged the wonderful work that NASA conducts today to better understand Earth and its environment. The majority wants to change that history. They want to abandon NASA as a multi-mission agency and instead focus primarily on the goal of human spaceflight. I strongly disagree with that approach. I believe in the multi-mission agency that NASA is and has always been. I too want NASA to travel to Mars, but not at the expense of understanding Earth and not at the expense of astronautics, astronautics research, which benefits our country in so many ways. Thus, my amendment would fully fund Earth science. It would fund the space launch system and the Orion at the levels they need to stay on track, funding levels above those authorized by the majority. It would reverse the cut of the astronautics funding and restore it to its fiscal year 2015 level. And it would accomplish this while still authorizing uh, about the same total amount of money for NASA that Congress authorized in 2012. Finally, my amendment would strike Section 103, which, to put it bluntly, is a simple, a bunch of nonsense. I've said it before that it is apparently worth repeating that contrary to the protestations of my Republican colleagues, the Budget Control Act does not apply to what we are doing here today. First of all, the BCA doesn't break down funding levels at all. It simply provides a number for all discretionary programs. It provides absolutely no guidance or restrictions at an agency level. As such, in theory, we must fund NASA at the level 10 times as great as provided in this bill and still not be in violation of the Budget Control Act. Second, and perhaps most important, an authorization does not provide funding, period. It simply provides recommended spending levels to the appropriators to carry out the functions in this authorization. It is then up to the appropriators to determine how much funding is available and what program areas to prioritize with the available funding. Frankly, it's embarrassing that Democratic members of this committee have to keep restating elementary concepts of legislating to our Republican colleagues. 
but you keep insisting on ignoring legislative process and precedent. Let's turn over a few pages in the 114th and legislative, uh, legislate responsibly, and let's take a small step toward restoring NASA to the innovation powerhouse we want it to be. And I urge my colleagues to support this amendment, and I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. And the gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Palazzo, is recognized in opposition to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the ranking member's amendment that seeks to increase overall funding for NASA above the President's budget request. I share her passion for NASA, as everybody on this committee does, as well as her commitment to national priority programs such as SLS and Orion. Unfortunately, the ranking member's amendment strikes the provision in the bill that keeps this legislation compliant with the Budget Control Act. The provision also does not require that the additional funds be offset within the existing discretionary caps. I'd like to work with the ranking member going forward to find appropriate offsets that do not violate the President's Budget Control Act. But for now, I must oppose the gentlelady's amendment, and I ask my colleagues to also oppose. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Palazzo. Are there are others who wish to be heard on the amendment. The gentlelwoman from Maryland, Ms. Edwards, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm um, speaking today in support of the gentlelady's amendment. Um, the amendment would fix the problems with the underlying bill while it leaves intact the policy language, which is the result of our bipartisan negotiations to which I've referred uh, before that already passed out of this House and out of a previous House. The amendment, if adopted, would make H.R. 2039 a NASA bill that we could all be truly proud of supporting. Uh, I just want to point out again that among the universities um, that are part of the University Space Research As Association um, really strongly um, uh, in opposition to this uh, legislation encouraging us to try to find a common way uh, forward include the Alabama A&M University, the University of Alabama in Huntsville where a lot of jobs are going to be lost if we don't pass this amendment. The University of Arkansas Florida State University, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, Mississippi State University, the um, State University in uh, the ranking, uh, the uh, subcommittee ranking members uh, state, uh, Rice University and almost the entire state of Texas university system, uh, Texas Tech University, Texas A&M University, University of Texas at Arlington, University of Texas in Austin, University of Texas in Dallas, University of Texas Medical uh, Branch. The reason is because all of these universities, and the, the gentlelady from uh, Virginia, Virginia Polytechnical Institute and the University of Virginia, all in opposition to what we're doing here today, the University of Wisconsin in, at Madison. And the reason that the research community is opposed to the underlying bill and supports this amendment in a common way forward is precisely because they know that it will undercut the work that's being done at NASA. It will set us uh, not just one step backwards, but a giant leap uh, backwards. It would be nice if we could get back to being an authorizing committee again and not simply trying to shadow whatever the uh, Commerce Justice State Subcommittee is doing. You know, NASA's always been a bipartisan endeavor, and part of the reason for that is NASA's always had bipartisan detractors. By turning this process into a distinctly partisan one, the majority is risking the delicate balance of support that sustained NASA for the last uh, 50 years. And I just want to remind the majority uh, the fact is that you've gotten way out of the practice of, uh, of a bipartisan approach for authorization. And virtually every agency in the science committee's jurisdiction is operating under a lapsed authorization, including this one. So whatever it is the majority has been doing these last four years, it just is not working for NASA. It's not working for the, um, the, um, uh, the industry. Uh, the amendment would maintain NASA as a multi-mission agency by fully funding Earth science, aeronautics, and space technology. The amendment also funds SLS and Orion at the levels needed to keep these projects on track, even at a time where we, um, the, the majority complains if a program is falling behind but doesn't provide the resources to keep it on track. It really just doesn't uh, make sense. And for the members who are on the other side of the aisle, who either don't know or have forgotten, an authorization looks like what the um, gentlelady's amendment is. And it would tell the Appropriations Committee what we believe is necessary 
in fulfilling NASA's missions. And then it's the job of the appropriators uh, to make sure that they can allocate those appropriations um, um, uh, fairly and in, in, in balance. But our job is different as an authorizing committee. And all of the gentlemen who are on the walls here who have been uh, chairman of this committee, boy, it would be nice to see a gentle lady as chair on one of these pictures on these committees. Um, but all of the, the gentlemen uh, across this wall have always understood the importance of a bipartisan approach uh, to, uh, to funding NASA, to funding our research. And it is why the research community, the um, university community, on every, in every single research institution located in every single one of the states represented by the members on this committee is soundly and resoundly opposed to what uh, the um, majority is doing. I strongly urge a yes vote to get us back uh, to a balanced approach uh, by supporting uh, Ms. Johnson's amendment. And with that, I guess I have to yield. Uh, thank you, Ms. Edwards. Just real quickly, I don't believe any of the universities that you have mentioned has written us a letter. They're members of an organization that opposes some of the bill and supports some of the bill, but I don't want your comments to be taken literally because I don't believe they're accurate. Uh, are there other members who wish to be recognized to discuss the amendment? If not, the question is on agreeing to the amendment offered by Ms. Johnson. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Thank you, Chair. The noes have it. A recorded uh, vote has been requested, and pursuant to committee rules, a recorded vote on the amendment offered by Ms. Johnson will be postponed. Uh, we will go to the next amendment on the roster to be offered by Ms. Edwards, and she is recognized for that purpose. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. And the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 2039, offered by Ms. Edwards of Maryland. Page 5, line 12. Strike. With that objection, the amendment will be considered as read, and the gentlewoman is recognized to explain her amendment. Mr. Chairman, my amendment would restore the drastic and harmful cuts that the majority's bill makes to NASA's Earth Science programs, restoring the funding level to that proposed by the administration. Mr. Chairman, the importance of NASA's Earth Science programs cannot be overstated. These globally recognized programs uncover significant information about our home planet improving our ability to accurately forecast both long-term changes and short-term weather events such as violent and destructive storms. The cuts made by the majority's proposed bill would reduce drastically annual funding for earth science, almost half a billion dollars below the President's requested levels, and $322 million below the FY 2015 appropriation. These draconian reductions will have a massive impact on NASA programs and centers. With hundreds of millions of dollars cut from JPL, Goddard Space Flight Center, Ames Research Center, Armstrong Research, uh, Flight Research Center, and many others. Let me give you an example of the damage that these cuts would do. A 25 percent annual reduction to applied science technology and research and analysis projects resulting in no new project solicitation in the entire fiscal year 2016. This cancellation of approximately 20 calls in FY 2016 would mean that close to 500 grants would not be selected, a loss of over $100 million to the earth science research community. This bill would also mean a cut of over $300 million from flight projects, resulting in a loss of data continuity in all of our important climate measurements. Major missions such as Landsat 9, the radiation budget instrument, and the total spectral solar irradiation sensor. Instruments would be delayed by at least two to three years. Landsat 9, scheduled to be built right up the road here at the Goddard Space Flight Center, is the most recent in a long series of satellites that have provided accurate measurements of Earth's land cover for over 43 years. In addition to routine data gathering, the Landsat satellites support disaster response and help our nation's firefighters assess the severity of wildfires. And we must not, must not lose sight of the fact that cuts to NASA programs mean cuts to NASA's workforce. Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland alone employs approximately 10,000 blue-collar and white-collar workers. By slashing these funds, we put at risk hundreds, if not thousands, of American jobs all across the country. H.R. 2013. 
39 makes these huge cuts to the Earth Science Program while still calling for NASA to ensure a steady cadence of large, medium, and small Earth science missions and to increase the number of venture class projects as part of a balanced Earth science program. You cannot have it both ways. How can we slash NASA's budget with one hand and require them to increase the number of projects with the other? It doesn't make any sense, Mr. Chairman. No NASA program should be gutted in order to plus up another program, and especially not for purely ideological reasons. NASA is and always has been a true multi-mission agency. It leads the world. And the underlying bill would cripple a research program that is vital to understanding our Earth and its environments. I urge my colleagues to support the Earth Science Programs, to restore the funding, and to support my amendment. And I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady yields back the balance of her time. Does the gentleman from California, Mr. Rohrbacher, seek recognition? I certainly do. Thank you very much. He's recognized for five minutes. And I appreciate Ms. Edwards' amendment and her passion for NASA's Earth Science Program. And I'm sure if she stays around long enough, she's going to have her picture right on the wall up there. And uh, But she might be in the United States Senate before that. Who knows? But uh, we've appreciated working with Ms. Edwards. She takes this, her job very seriously, and uh, that's something all of us should appreciate. Although we can have... Uh, disagreements that are not purely ideological. Sometimes the disagreements are practical in nature. For example, we are not talking about cutting the NASA budget. Uh, my reading, if it is, is the NASA budget that we're talking about is about the same as what we had last year. And we're talking about setting the priorities in the NASA budget. And prioritizing is much different than the idea of cutting, just cutting the budget. And in fact, however, when you're talking about how many hundreds of billions of dollars that we are borrowing every year from China uh, in, order to, <laughs> in order to just make our government operate, uh, maybe um, trying to find some places to cut might well be justified. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, Rather than increasing more spending, uh, which is what uh, Ms. Edwards is proposing, is let's not pr prioritize here. Let's just increase the overall spending level. Uh, and what we're presented, what we're really saying is, let's borrow even more money from China in order to do more things. Well, I have no doubt that the things that are being suggested are wonderful options. And if we had all, and if we were just not spending the money that our grandchildren are going to have to pay for, uh, they might well be so justified. But uh, I'm sorry that right now I must oppose this amendment. I encourage my colleagues to do the same because um, what we're really talking about uh, in Ms. Edwards' amendment is, again, borrowing more money uh, from China in order to do more things, and they may be good things. But also, uh, uh, let me suggest that what we're trying to do with earth science is that we understand at least that can be done by somebody else other than NASA. I mean, we've got uh, data being used by other agencies and Department of Agriculture and the Forest Service. Many of the things that were just mentioned to us actually are the responsibilities of uh, various other uh, government agencies. And uh, in fact, there are 12 other federal agencies performing earth science. But NASA is the only uh, the only bureau uh, agency that we that makes basically explores uh, space, and that should be you know that should be our focus. If you don't focus on your job, the, the central job, you know, try to do too much for too many people, and you're not going to get anything done for anybody. And that's been my rule of thumb here, and uh, I think it applies to what we're talking about. And uh, uh, I would just suggest, um, I don't want to toot my own horn here or anything, but I did suggest to people that when we went into the SLS program and we started talking about building that big rocket, that they were going to have to be priorities set and people were going to have to come down and, and find out what where that co extra cost would be. And um, Ms. Edwards was, I think, and continues to be a big supporter of of that pro that massively new expensive program, 
And uh, so I would suggest that we be responsible. We try to uh, restructure things so that NASA is doing what it's supposed to do and that other agencies can't do. And uh, that's the responsible way to, to proceed. I don't think that that means I'm being ideological. I think that means being that you sort of practice a responsible uh, uh, way of, uh, of budgeting. Uh, rather than simply uh, ignoring the fact that we're still borrowing significant sums of money that are putting our grandchildren in debt. So I would ask uh, my colleagues to oppose this amendment, and uh, but appreciate the passion on the other side of the aisle for trying to wish we could, yeah, I wish we could do more. I agree with you that uh, I wish we could do more, and there's all kinds of wonderful things that we could be doing. And uh, we should try to get our uh, system in order so that uh, we're that, that we have a growth rate that will actually uh, uh, sustain more uh, uh, spending for building a space infrastructure, which is what I believe basically should be our priority. Which is, I believe, we need to have a space infrastructure so that will service all these other needs eventually by utilizing space for the benefit of human beings. Uh, so I ask my colleagues to oppose this amendment. Gentle's time, gentlemen's time has expired. Does the ranking member uh, seek to be recognized? Yes, Mr. Chairman. General Lake is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. I move to strike the last word. Uh, I want to thank Ms. Edwards for offering this amendment, which would restore Earth science funding uh, at NASA. As I mentioned in my opening statement, the majority's cuts to earth science are driven by one thing, anti-science ideology, which rejects the notion of a human role in climate change. There really isn't any other rational reason for these cuts. It doesn't make any sense to want to study every planet in our solar system except for the one we live on. And the results of NASA's Earth Science Program benefit our nations greatly. Past work in this area has ultimately helped our weather and climate forecasting and has had tremendously beneficial effects on land use and monitoring and planning. But the benefits of this work to our country and to our citizens apparently don't matter to some of my colleagues, all because of one issue where they're on the wrong side of history, climate change. Now, my Republican colleagues will say that other agencies should do this work. Who? The majority has balked at the climate work of NOAA performing, even going so far as to prohibiting NOAA from organizing a climate service. The majority also attacks DOD and DOE and Department of Agriculture, the NSF and EPA programs that have anything to do with climate. So let's be honest. This isn't about what's best for NASA. It's about attacking the substance of the work because the majority doesn't believe in science. My Republican colleagues are also very fond of saying how much the Earth Sciences account has grown, as though that justifies cutting it. However, I'd like to point out that in 2001, when we had a Republican president and a Republican Congress, Earth Science was funded at just under $1.5 billion. Those are not even inflation adjusted, but rather actual uh, year dollars. So the majority here today is proposing to cut Earth Sciences $48 million below the 2001 levels. That hardly sounds like rational rebalancing. What it does mean, does seem like, is a punitive cut to the program that conducts research in a field of science my colleagues don't believe in. We are the science committee. Oh, to that, a lot better than what we're getting. I strongly urge adoption of Ms. Edwards' amendment, and I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Molinar, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, I, I also uh, oppose the amendment and, and would like to state um, as a former, uh, was a chemistry major and someone whose district relies heavily on innovation and science, I strongly believe in the importance of science. 
Uh, my concern is that uh, while other important science programs have had their budget cut, um, in the last six years the Earth Science Program budget has expanded by more than 62 percent and in fact is actually crowding out funding for other programs. And I believe that this bill establishes a balance uh, between exploration and science, uh, funding both at $4.95 billion. Um, and within the science account, uh, Earth science is funded at $1.45 billion and planetary science is funded at $1.5 billion. And I believe in a balanced portfolio. And when it comes to the investment, uh, as has already been mentioned, there are 13 other agencies that have climate science programs. And, and uh, I believe that this bill still allows for a robust Earth and climate science program authorizing 1.45 billion, um, roughly in line with the other science disciplines. But NASA's mission is unique. And while 13 other agencies are working on climate science, it's NASA is the only federal agency focused on space <laughs> exploration. And uh, my concern is uh, we have always been a country who has led in the area of space exploration, and I believe we need to continue that progress and uh, I believe this amendment moves us in the wrong direction. Thank you very much, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Molinar. Uh, the gentlewoman from Oregon, Ms. Bonamici, is recognized. Uh, I move to strike the last word. The gentlewoman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we just received a letter from the Association <clears throat> of Public and Land Grant Universities, which I would like to uh, enter into the record. With that objection. The letter is uh, titled Fail Failure to Launch, and it's a statement in opposition uh, to this legislation. Instead of reaching for the stars, the initial draft of the NASA Authorization Act for 2016 and 2017 falls short of providing the support for the next generation of Earth and space exploration that will allow us to better understand and protect our planet and answer a vast array of fundamental questions regarding the universe. And the letter continues, instead of taking the next giant leaps for mankind, the bill yields to the force of gravity and actually moves the U.S. backward in science investments. At the same time, our competitor countries are rapidly working to strategically overtake us in space and earth science exploration. This bill would further a growing innovation deficit in which the U.S. unnecessarily foregoes critical investments while other nations make the advancements our researchers should be making. And, and Mr. Chairman, I, I want to continue uh, to, to cite some, some information that's in the letters already uh, entered into the record. And with regard to the Association of American Universities, of which my alma mater, University of Oregon, is a member, I'm glad that the association spoke with a collective voice. And perhaps if we had had slightly more than a week notice about the markup, we would have heard from individual institutions. But with that short notice, I appreciate that the association uh, submitted their, their letter in opposition. The American Geophysical Union, also concerned about the earth science cuts, uh, talks about how more generally Earth Science Division missions aid in flood prediction, earthquake response, the tracking of severe storms and tornadoes. Greater knowledge and prediction skill are urgent when we consider the effort, time, and cost of protecting infrastructure along coasts, rebuilding fish populations, managing water resources for manufacturing and agriculture, and restoring communities in the wake of hazards. The uh, American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics also is very concerned and opposed because of this cut uh, to Earth sciences. And they state, we must not lose sight of the fact that the success of Earth observation and weather monitoring, among other things, remain vitally important to the sustained economic prosperity and national security of the United States. NASA can not only be about exploring Mars, resupplying the International Space Station, and fostering public, private public partnerships for continued space development. It is equally important to ensure NASA is funded to enable accurate weather forecasting, drought conditions monitoring, ocean temperature tracking, agriculture yield prediction, and soil quality and erosion assessment. And finally, Mr. Chairman, the Geological Society of America writes that investment in NASA Earth science is necessary for America's future economics and science and technology leadership. 
both through discoveries and advances that are made and the scientific talent developed through their programs. The data and observations from Earth observing missions and research are tremendously important. Resource for natural resource exploration exploration, land use planning, and assessing water resources, the impacts of natural disasters, and global agriculture production. Mr. Chairman, the, the Executive Director of the Geological Society of America, Vicki McConnell, Oregonian, uh, concludes investment in earth science research is vital to increase U.S. competitiveness and further our understanding of our place in the universe. We urge the committee to reconsider the cuts to earth science research as you seek to shape NASA's future and therefore the standing of the American scientific community. We have the opportunity to do this with Ms. Edwards' amendment, which I strongly support, and I yield my remaining minute to Ms. Edwards, the sponsor of the amendment. I thank the gentlelady for yielding her remaining minute. I just want to point out um, that uh, what it means, um, the cuts mean, and the reason that I've introduced this amen amendment is because it would mean fewer research grants and contracts for universities that do work in earth science. Universities like the University of Alabama in Huntsville, Ohio State University, the University of Virginia, the University of Illinois, and Arizona State University. These universities all do earth science research that would be deeply impacted unless we restore uh, the research components uh, here um, in, this, in this authorization. It means there will be fewer earth observing spacecraft and systems built in places like Northern Virginia, Southern California, Colorado, and a host of other uh, places. It means there will be less basic research and applied earth science work carried out at Stennis in Mississippi, Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama, Langley in Virginia, Goddard in Maryland, and JPL in California. And with that, I yield. Uh, thank you, Ms. Edwards. Uh, let me mention that I think every single Democratic member this morning has complained about six days not being enough notice of a markup. And I want to repeat the same thing I said during markup of the Competes Act where we gave the minority seven days notice, uh, that House rules only require 48 hours notice. Maybe in the future we will try to go strictly by the House rules and the six days and seven days notice will be more appreciated. Uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Swalwell, is recognized for his comments. Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also speak in favor of the uh, Edwards Amendment. Earth science is space science, and space science is earth science. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, you were kind enough to lead a uh, delegation to Antarctica uh, with members of this committee back in December. I very much uh, enjoyed that trip. I learned a lot, and uh, one of uh, I thought the most informative uh, members of that trip was NASA astronaut uh, John Grunsfeld, who traveled with us on that trip. And I remember uh, John marveling as we flew over the McMurdo Dry Valleys uh, in Antarctica. And John told the group that these dry valleys uh, most closely resemble on Earth uh, the terrain that we would find on Mars. Uh, there is not a disconnect between uh, what we have here on Earth and what we can learn uh, in our solar system, and I, I would uh, encourage the chairman and uh, my colleagues across the aisle to appreciate uh, that earth science is space science, space science is earth science, and that today's uh, proposed authorization uh, vastly underfunds uh, earth science. And I would hope that all of us here are seeking to find the best policies to equip our agencies with the tools to serve the American people and conduct high-quality research. If my colleagues honestly believe that NASA should not be doing any Earth science, uh, which is a, sen a sentiment that has been expressed in the past, the next logical question is, what agency should the federal government have to conduct this research? When I look back at previous remarks about NOAA's budget or the DOE's budget or NSF's budget, and most notice notably the budget of the EPA, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have used the same refrain, which is to argue against any climate or Earth science being used. Uh, and so uh, I have two questions, and I would yield to any of my colleagues uh, who would like to answer this on the other side. Can we justify which research institution or expert recommends cutting the earth science budget at NASA and any proposal on who should be doing or conducting earth science in the federal government? And I would yield if anyone would wish to offer uh, a justification for that. 
Mr. Chairman, I don't see any of my colleagues wishing to offer a justification which can only lead me to believe that there really is not a logical uh, justification. And I hope that we can return to the bipartisanship that has occurred around funding Earth science at NASA because, uh, and I will conclude, Earth science is space science and space science is Earth science. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barlow. Are there others who wish to be heard? If not, the question is on agreeing to the amendment offered by Ms. Edwards. All in, uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Takano, is recognized. I move to strike last. Uh, the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm sorry that uh, I'm making these comments uh, as uh, my colleague, uh, my good colleague from California, has left the room. Uh, uh, he posed uh, an interesting dilemma about uh, our children having to pay for, uh, you know, uh, if we were to uh, adopt Ms. Edwards' amendment. Uh, have to pay for it in the future, and is worried about the indebtedness to uh, to China. Uh, you know, I am also concerned about our indebtedness to China, but there are ways in which we can avoid uh, going into further debt. We can look to other parts of uh, uh, the budget, uh, and I would suggest to you that uh, our investments in science and basic scientific research are seed corn, and we don't want to ever eat our seed corn. Uh, and uh, to take that analogy further. Uh, I am worried also about uh, the advancements within China and other nations uh, in their scientific endeavors, and that uh, our children will also pay a heavy price if our country loses its preeminence in science. Uh, and uh, I would suggest that we need to return to uh, a spirit of uh, a bipartisan interest in keeping uh, um, this nation's edge in science, and I, uh, I will enthusiastically support uh, uh, my colleague uh, from Maryland's uh, amendment. Thank you, Mr. Takano. Uh, the question is on agreeing to the amendment offered by Ms. Edwards. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed say no. No. In opinion of the chair, the no is The amendment is not agreed to, and pursuant to committee rules, a recorded vote on the amendment uh, will be postponed. Uh, we will now go to an amendment, I believe, to be offered by the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Byron. He's recognized for that purpose. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. And the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 2039, offered by Mr. Byer of Virginia. <coughs> Page 5, line 12. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read, and the gentleman is recognized to explain his amendment. Yeah, thank you, Chairman Smith. Uh, aeronautics research contributes to the nation's economic growth and job creation through pioneering transformative, transformative capabilities that enable the U.S. aviation industry to maintain and advance its global leadership. Those of us flying today take for granted the winglets at the tip of jetliner wings. And most passengers flying today have scant knowledge of the modern jetliner's supercritical wing, where the airfoil is flatter on the top and rounder on the bottom, with a downward curve on the trailing edge. Without sounding overly technical, that unique shape helps delay the onset of drag, thus increasing the fuel efficiency of aircraft flying close to the speed of sound, and that's critical to today's airlines. What's important to note is that all of these critical innovations were the result of NASA's aeronautics research. Another revolutionary technology being developed in collaboration with the Air Force and the private sector is an airplane wing that is able to bend itself like a bird's wing, providing the same functionality with much less weight. This project, recently unveiled, can be used to increase fuel efficiency, saving millions in air travel, and an even reduced noise at takeoff and landing, something many of my constituents living national, near National Airport appreciate. So, Mr. Chairman, today more than ever, we need NASA's aeronautics research to be able to continue to innovate. But that ability to innovate and reduce technical risks so that these innovations can find their way into production aircraft is hampered by funding levels that haven't even kept pace with inflation. Fortunately, the Congress recognized this harmful state of affairs and responded by providing higher than requested funding in fiscal year 2015. In particular, House Appropriations noted in recommending this higher appropriation that it was, quote, frustrated by NASA's lack of budgetary support for the aeronautics program. More than any other NASA activity, aeronautics research directly impacts the lives of taxpayers through technologies that improve the commercial flying experience and reduce airline costs, leading to reduced upward pressure on airfares. Unfortunately, the administration has once again identified levels for aeronautics research in fiscal year 2016 and 17 that are lower than those appropriated in 2015. And the bill before us today does nothing to rectify the problem, but just matches those lower levels. So my amendment would match aeronautics FY 2016 funding to that appropriated last year in 2015 and provide for inflationary growth in 2017. It will enable NASA to continue its work assisting the Federal Aviation Administration in the development and transfer of revolutionary air traffic management tools that will increase the efficiency of the national air transportation system while ensuring safety. 
and it will allow NASA to continue to develop new concepts and technologies for aircraft, improving efficiency and minimizing environmental air impact and aircraft noise. And finally, these funding levels will allow increased research investments in emerging areas such as the integration of small unmanned aircraft systems and the national airspace system. Mr. Chairman, robust funding for aeronautics is something that should be supported across the party lines. And I urge my fellow members to support this amendment so that NASA and its partners in industry and academia can continue to develop the innovative breakthroughs that we need. Mr. Chair, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Byer. And the gentleman from California, Mr. Knight, is recognized in opposition to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. i move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, too, uh, believe that uh, aeronautics is uh, a big part of NASA. It is the first A in NASA, and it has been for, uh, for uh, over 100 years. The, uh, the issues are... When a lot of us, us freshmen, run for uh, office, we talk about things that uh, we're not just talking about in a, uh, in a discussion when you're running for office. You actually want to do it, and part of that is responsible budgeting. Responsible budgeting doesn't mean you can find money from somewhere else so that you can spend it on your program. It doesn't mean that we're going to look at other parts of the budget so we can grab money and we can use it here. There's probably no one that has more aeronautics from NASA than I do in my district. I have most of the projects in my district, including world mapping, including what we just did with GCAT, including what we've done with hypersonic, supersonic, jousting, all of the programs that you talk about, were probably started in my district or are working in my district today. So when I talk about responsible budgeting, I also have to look at my own backyard. I can't just say, look, I'm going to support everything that I've got as opposed to what you might have. We have to look at NASA's budget as a whole. I, too, would like aeronautics to be a bigger part, and I think that uh, when the administrator, uh, Charlie Bolden, was here, I talked about that, and I talked about how 3% of the budget was too low, and that if we are truly going to work on new programs and bring new uh, projects to light, then we have to bring that budget up. This is not the way to do it. If we're going to have responsible budgeting, that means that we have to look at our own backyard. That means we have to look at every project that we've got. This is a responsible budget to what the project, to where we are today. We have overspent for the last umpteen years. We have to get this in line. So as I move forward and I talk about aeronautics for uh, NASA and the projects that we're going to be working on, I am going to be working with the administrator and say, look, Let's start uh, looking at the projects that we've got to prioritize. If it's more than 3%, then that's what we've got to work on. But today, these projects have to be funded by what we've got in a responsible budget. I yield back the balance of my time. Um, thank you, Mr. Knight. Is there further discussion on the amendment? If not, Mr. Chairman, who seeks recognition? The general <laughs> don't have to look very far. Uh, the ranking member, Ms. Johnson, is recognized. I move to strike the last word. The gentleman, gentlewoman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, I want to thank Mr. Byer for offering this amendment, uh, which will restore the um, aeronautical funding for aeronautics funding for NASA. Uh, growth in the air transportation system is essential to the economic well-being of our nation, indirectly or directly providing almost a billion American jobs. However, countries with less mature capabilities often view aeronautics as a key strategic area in technology, education, and workforce development. And these countries are moving aggressively to invest in aeronautics and aviation. We cannot afford to rest on our laurels. Uh, because of the lengthy gestation period needed to move from concept to deployment, industry has often not been able to apply resources to high-risk fundamental aeronautics R&D, an investment often needed as a forerunner to eventually bringing to market new technologies and capabilities. Successive administrations and Congresses have believed that NASA has a unique role to play in this uh, pre-competitive area and C, sustaining the nation's competitive edge in aviation as requiring sustained government investment in R&D. 
and that is why I support this amendment, we need the NASA development tools and technologies to help manufacturers keep the U.S. aviation industry competitive with other countries. Right now, we are passing around letters and collecting signatures trying to protect airspace and trying to protect our uh, airlines uh, from all of the encroachment of other countries. The only way we can do that is to be technologically ahead of them. The higher funding in this amendment would allow that to happen and maintains momentum in, in enabled by the Congress fiscal year 2015 appropriations for aeronautics. I urge my colleagues to think ahead and support this amendment. It will help our entire nation and create jobs. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. And the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Posey, is recognized. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate Mr. Byers' uh, well-intended amendment and uh, his passion for the aeronautics research program. I, I share that passion. Uh, this amendment would increase the authorized levels above the President's request. Uh, the authorized levels in the current bill already fund the aeronautics program at the President's request. This amendment would expand the overall costs uh, of the legislation without identifying any of the offsets. So, you know, we don't have a bottomless pot here. We have to, you know, take something from somebody else to, to give to somebody different, and we don't identify that offset. We don't say who we're going to take the money away from here. Uh, the authorizing committees have a responsibility uh, to give guidance to the Appropriations Committee on program priorities. Uh, by ignoring the Budget Control Act spending caps, and I voted against the Budget Control Act, by the way, um, appropriators must comply with them. Uh, we are abdicating our authorizing responsibilities. Uh, we need to do better than ignore the budget law and allow appropriation to establish all funding levels. Uh, for this reason, uh, though I wish we had more money uh, and we could put more funding in it, uh, I must oppose the amendment and, and encourage my colleagues to do the same. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Posey. Are there others who wish to be heard on the amendment? The gentlewoman from, uh, from Maryland is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief. I'm uh, today in support of Mr. Byers' amendment. I just want to point out that um, I know we entered into the record a letter from the Association of American Universities, and I know that um, the association describes itself as speaking on behalf of 60 leading public and private research um, universities, some of which I read before, including parts of the University of Texas System, University of Virginia, uh, the California universities, uh, the Georgia Institute of Technology, among others, speaking on their behalf, even though we haven't heard from the individual institutions, speaking on their behalf, they say that for space technology, and I quote from their letter, for space technology, the Space Technology Directorate, the authorization bill proposes essentially flat funding under the aspirational budget and a 16 percent cut under the constrained budget. The proposed authorization for the Aeronautics Mission Directorate is 14 percent below the 2015 appropriation level of funding. Therefore, we, that is the collective we of those 60 plus um, universities and research institutions, therefore we, the committee, we urge the committee to reconsider the proposed cuts uh, to the to uh, SMD space technology and aeronautics uh, directories. That's coming from those institutions that do research in space technology and Would aeronautics. You have uh, I, no, I will not. Question? Um, what I will point out, however, is that um, when you look at these cuts, they're going to hit jobs very clearly, jobs in a very tough economy at and around NASA's Langley Research Center in Virginia and the NASA Glenn Research Center in Ohio. And that isn't just those are the those are around university research. It's also around uh, the private sector and, of course, those uh, centers direct, directly. It would also mean fewer research opportunities in aeronautics at universities like Georgia Tech. And with that, I yield the balance of my time. Uh, thank you, Ms. Edwards. The gentleman from California seek to be recognized? Um, yes, thank uh, you The gentleman much. is recognized. Um, 
Uh, the question I was going to ask Ms. Edwards uh, was specifically, and maybe you could answer now, uh, what offset did those 60 institutions offer us uh, uh, in terms of just spending more money uh, uh, and going further into debt? What was the offset that they decided was less important that they wanted us to cut in the, in, in the NASA budget? If the that, gentleman would yield his I time. I certainly will. Um, you know, I know, I, I guess some of the frustration here in the Congress is that some of us who sit on authorizing committees would prefer to be on appropriations committees. But this is an authorizing uh, committee, and one of our responsibilities is to speak to the direction that we want the agency uh, to go. And right. um, so it's not the responsibility of the authorizing committee to offer offsets. That is the responsibility of the appropriators to figure out uh, the money. Our responsibility is to figure out the direction of the agency and then to speak to that direction because that is a direction that we believe policy needs right. to go. And it certainly is not the responsibility of the institutions receiving the grants and doing the research uh, to, uh, to speak to um, what their offset would be. Reclaiming my time, that is exactly what is going is getting our country in massive debt. And that is not the choice. It is every one of our jobs, whether even, even if we're not on this committee, uh, it is our job to try to, to bring responsible priorities and spending priorities uh, to uh, and put them in law and to back them so that indeed our grandchildren won't have to owe more money uh, to the Chinese if they're going to pay off or whoever it is that they owe money to. Uh, the fact is that uh, these institutions <coughs> Uh, if you gave them a choice of priority, maybe they wouldn't be sending this letter because maybe they uh, say, well, would you rather have the 60 uh, institutions you're talking about? Would they rather have the spending on these things that they're going to get the money for uh, if they had to, for example, give up certain tax advantages that we give to universities and for people to donate to universities in order to make sure that we have a balance in, in money coming in and going out? Uh, that's what's being. Re that's what's called being responsible. And no, those of us on our authorization committees do feel absolutely obligated to do the responsible thing, rather than saying, "Well, well we're going to just spend." By the way, if you're spending all money in all directions, that's what. I mean, is there any limit to what we can? Uh, there's lots of ideas that can come up that might make somebody happy in the university or or happy throughout the country. No, if we are to be responsible, we've got to redirect where the, this limited amount of resources our country has and our government has right now and make sure it's put to best use. And uh, that requires us to think about it and not to slough it off on appropriators. Thank you very much, Mr. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Warbacher. Now, the question is on the the gentleman from California, Mr. Takano, is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last for, word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, it, well, uh, again, I, while the gentleman uh, uh, from California uh, is in the room, I, I would pose this, uh, I would pose uh, the dilemma in a different manner. Uh, yes, it is true that uh, we have uh, the Chinese investing in a number of American bonds, and uh, they do finance uh, some portion of um, our spending budget. Uh, but I'm also worried about keeping our preeminence in science, and especially in the area of aeros aerospace. And you know that aerospace uh, is a, a huge part of Southern California's um, uh, economy, uh, including the activity that goes on in the, uh, the other gentleman from California's district uh, in, in the high desert. And uh, I believe that uh, Mr. Byer's amendment is not only good for the nation, but especially good for California. Um, and I don't understand why uh, we are not united as Californians behind Mr. Byer's uh, amendment, uh, which would enhance um, uh, the sort of basic scientific research that goes on to keep our preeminence uh, in aerospace. Um, uh, it's obvious that uh, Boeing is a, you know, is a highly respected company. It's an American company that draws upon uh, the research. We compete well against Airbus. Uh, I'm worried about uh, the advances that are going on in Embraer and the investments that are going on in China uh, that, uh, that, will not, that will also threaten uh, the prosperity of our grandchildren. Uh, and uh, as, the, as the authorizing committee, um, we do have, I think, a responsibility to set the direction and to make clear to the American people 
uh, that we stand behind keeping this country's competitive edge. Would the gentleman yield? Would the, I, will yield I will yield to the uh, just, just to note that uh, Boyne is the biggest employer in my district, and uh, many of the projects that we're talking about are in my district. And uh, uh, I am very frank with aer aerospace uh, employees and, and workers, and, and I think we all have to be uh, treat other uh, our, our people as grown ups and, and able to understand that you can't spend everything for everybody and, and expect that our country is going to get anything done in the long run. And uh, I think people understand that we got to prioritize and some. And if it meant, and I and I honestly believe this because I've had to explain, I've talked to Boeing employees before. They understand that you've got to set priorities, and sometimes the, just because it's in your district or just because it's in California that you can't do it because it might not be good for the country as a whole. And going in further into debt than what we're in right now is not good for our country as a could, whole. If I could reclaim my time, Mr. Certainly. Chairman, uh, I, a lot of those employees are traveling from my district to your district uh, <clears throat> because they can afford the housing better in my district. And uh, <laughs> I, <w> I, <laughs> I would say to you, I would say to the gentleman uh, uh, that uh, uh, I, I would uh, have a different take on how I would explain our responsibility to uh, uh, to these employees of Boeing, uh, that uh, we have a responsibility to keep America's technical, technological edge, and that it's not irresponsible uh, for us to make a priority these investments in basic scientific research, where the private sector, frankly, uh, doesn't have the kind of incentives uh, to uh, spend in such a general way. It, it, only the federal government can make these sort of investments that will, in the basic, uh, basic research and development, that will keep our country ahead. Uh, and I, I would argue that we need to find a way, in a bipartisan way, to recommit ourselves to that mission. Thank you, Mr. Takano. Uh, the question is on the buyer amendment. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Can you chair the no's have it and the amendment is not agreed to? And the gentleman requests a recorded vote and pursuant to committee rules, recorded vote will be postponed. Um, okay. The next amendment on the roster will be offered by the gentleman from California, Dr. Barron. He is recognized. I have an amendment at the desk. And the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 2039, offered <coughs> by Mr. Barra of California. Page Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read, and the gentleman is recognized to explain his amendment. Thank you, Chairman Smith. You know, I'll reiterate a lot of the comments uh, of my colleagues. Um, as a kid that was born and raised and grew up in Southern California in Downey, you know, Rockwall International was a place where a lot of my friends' parents worked, and you, know, you grew up with this vibrant um, aerospace e economy. And you know, I, I do share my colleagues' concerns about the budget and the debt that we may be leaving our children and grandchildren, um, but I also share the concern that we're living off of the legacy of our parents and grandparents, the investments that they made, the the, the progress that they made, and. When we're looking at budgets, it's not just the absolute number. We're also looking at where we make our strategic investments because there is a return on those investments. So the investments that we made in the 50s and 60s in aerospace and space technology absolutely grew our economy and in, in many ways gave us that economic might that you know, not only led the space race but gave us so many other technologies that we use in our everyday life. And, you know, grew so many new industries that have um, created this economic wealth in the United States. I understand that um, we have to get our fiscal house in order. We have to stay within our budgets. But just cutting across the board is not a strategic way to do this. Um, we have to have a more vibrant discussion about where we are going to make um, investments because, again, space technology has had um, – huge impact. We saw it when I was growing up again in Southern California and in the district I represent now um, in companies like Aerojet, Rocketdyne, you know, with um, engine technology. You know, it, it is something that I've talked about in this committee before. We've got to start building our own rocket engines uh, again, and that, that will only happen if we're investing in um, the next generation of propulsion systems like solar electric propulsion that, you know, as we talk about this mission to Mars, you know, we, 
we've we've got to make these investments again. I think, as my colleague Mr. Takano mentioned, I do worry that we're losing our technologic edge because of um, the lack of investment, the lack of forward thinking um, in the way that our parents and grandparents did. So, you know, I would urge the the committee to consider my amendment, which would restore the the FY 2016 and FY 2017 funding levels to those proposed by, by the President. Um, getting back to those levels will allow us to make those investments. It will allow us to grow and, and get a return on investment, and that economic growth will help us pay down our debt and deficit. So again, I, I urge my fellow members to support this amendment. I yield back the balance of my time. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Barron. And the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Babin, is recognized for his opposition. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, I appreciate Dr. Barra's uh, amendment and his passion for the space technology program, uh, but this amendment would increase the authorized levels for the space technology program and greatly expand the overall cost of this legislation. Uh, with an $18 trillion debt, we need to be mindful of the American taxpayer and my 12 grandchildren's future. Uh, for this reason, I must oppose this amendment and encourage my colleagues to do the same. But as we move forward with the bill, I would certainly like to work with Dr. Barra to identify offsets for his proposed increases to be sure that they comply with the President's Budget Control Act. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Babin. And the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Johnson, is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. The gentlewoman is recognized for five minutes. I want to thank uh, Dr. Barra for offering this amendment which would raise space technology funding to the President's request level. I know that a number of my colleagues on the committee are keenly interested, as I am, in forward-looking human space flight program. <clears throat> Last June, the committee held a hearing entitled Pathways to Exploration, a review of the future of human space exploration. At that hearing, we heard from co-chairs of the National Academies panel, one of whom was Governor Mitch Daniels. Despite being a fiscal conservative, he embraced the goal of human mission to Mars. In doing so, his panel also cautioned that to get to Mars, we have to be willing to invest in space technology. And from our colleagues who want to ensure that the nation's investments result in dividends to the overall economy. Do not overlook the benefits accrued from NASA's space technology program. Dr. Barra has described for you NASA's space technology activities and how they impact NASA's future missions and strengthen industry capabilities. His comment on engaging universities and graduate students and innovative research projects is worth highlighting. <clears throat> Space technology provides our younger generation with the opportunity to innovate in ways we have never imagined. This is a good amendment. <clears throat> it is consistent with maintaining a strong NASA that is capable of contributing to the overall economy. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment. And I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Are there others who wish to be heard on the amendment? The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Grayson, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I think it's inaccurate to say that Congressman Barra's amendment would vastly increase the federal debt. Uh, in fact, it's a, a remarkably modest proposal. What the Congressman is proposing is that we increase the overall spending under this bill, uh, the authorization by less than 1 percent, in fact, about two-thirds of 1 percent. And we, we focus that increase exclusively on increasing expenditures for space technology. Now, why is that important? Because nobody else is going to do it. Uh, there, there is no private se significant private sector investing at this point going on regarding space technology, nor is there likely to be any investment like that in research and development in the near future, certainly not to the tune of the 600 or $700 million at issue here. If we don't do it, then nobody will do it. And space, as we all know, being on this committee, is the frontier of the 21st century. 
it is one of the fundamental areas in which we can not just expand our knowledge, but expand our capabilities uh, as human beings. So I, I think that it is exactly in the context of a $16 trillion debt that we have to be careful not to be uh, penny wise and pound foolish. Uh, that's exactly what this comes down to. This is one of those areas where uh, we have to make sure that we don't underspend because we're only cheating ourselves. I yield back. And thank you, Mr. Grayson. The gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Palazzo, is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, I'd like to recognize Mr. Bobbin um, for as much time as he needs. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would like to enter into the record letters of support for the bills, um, human spaceflight goals, and search for life uh, in, the, in our universe. Uh, these uh, a number of them are from my district, um, including Bay Area Houston Economic Partnership, Coalition for Space Exploration, uh, Commercial Space Flight Federation, and the SETI Institute. If I may, uh, uh, without Chairman. objection, so ordered. Uh, thank you, Mr. Babin. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Palazzo, and the gentleman from California. Uh, let me just see if there's anyone on this side. Does anyone else seek to be recognized? The gentlewoman from Maryland, Ms. Edwards, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to put at, point out that um, I, I'm supporting Mr. Barra's amendment because I recognize in the underlying bill uh, when you cut $129 million, which is uh, what happens um, with the underlying bill, that NASA would need to delay development of several key technologies that affect a host of future missions and capabilities. It's why I support Mr. Barra's amendment, which I, I agree with my colleague from Florida. This is a very, very modest uh, amendment, and it includes um, what would be cut would include a delay in developing technologies, uh, coronagraph and starshade uh, needed to support direct detection of habitable exoplanets, planets, autonomous mobility systems for future science missions to planetary surfaces, including Mars and icy moons of the outer planets, and development of advanced composite technologies, which could improve the performance and reduce the manufacturing costs of future evolved SLS and Orion programs. And, and those proposed cuts are exactly why I support Mr. Barrow's amendments, because it would allow us to do the work that we need in space technologies. Um, the impact of these delays um, it could really delay significantly the availability of the technologies for exploration and science missions up to a decade. This would be a, do tremendous damage uh, to our, our, our nation's space uh, programs. And so with that, I urge the adoption of Mr. Barra's very, very modest um, amendment uh, to make sure that we can continue on the pathway uh, to engage in the space technology research that's really necessary uh, for us to move forward. And with that, I yield. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. And the gentleman from California, Mr. Nye, is recognized. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Move to strike the last word. I, uh, I'd like to work with Mr. Byer and Dr. Barra and uh, Mr. Takano on, uh, on these issues. And I think we can get there. I do think this is a bipartisan issue. I do think uh, when we're talking about space technology and aeronautics and, and many of the things that NASA does, it is a bipartisan. We both want to get to the same area. We both want to have a responsible budget. I know that. And we both want to have as many uh, projects in exploration as we possibly can. I know that too. Uh, but let's look at what's happening today. There is an awful lot of money, of private money that's going in, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars every year by companies like Maston and x and Virgin Galactic and Spaceship Company, and the list goes on and on of all of these billionaires that are rushing to become millionaires by getting into the space race. So there is a ton of private money that is being invested in not just suborbital work, but they are working on hypersonics. They are working on some of the things that we have talked about today, working on making uh, airliners safer, making them more economical, working on jet engines, making them more economical so that maybe we don't have to build things like uh, high-speed rail. But today, we do have to be very responsible in every dollar that we spend. And when we talk about modest increases, you know, we've done this in California, it's only a modest increase to the 
to the licensing fee for your uh, for your car. It's only a dollar. It's only a two dollar. And then when you buy a new car, it's five hundred dollars to register that car in California. Well, those are all modest fees that turned out to be something that was a little bit more than modest when they all added up. So we do have to look at how we're going to be responsible, how we're going to move forward, what's happening today with the technologies and the private money that's being invested. And part of that is, is what's happening for space technology and, and the advancement of, of the American space industry. So with that, Mr. Chair, I will uh, yield back my time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Knight. Uh, the question is on oh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Rohrbach, who's recognized. Uh, I'd just like to identify myself with the remarks of Mr. Knight. Um, we do have considerable, <clears throat> in case people have not noticed it, considerable investment in space technologies and developing new approaches to uh, uh, accomplishing <laughs> missions in space. And so this isn't, it's no longer uh, totally the focus of just government and, uh, and NASA and, and government employees, but investors and entrepreneurs and uh, businessmen who reach out and work with the universities. And uh, uh, these are, uh, this is a, a phenomena in our uh, country that we should be encouraging rather than trying to just only focus as if NASA was the only, uh, the only hope for actually accomplishing new technologies. However, let me note that NASA has played this important role, but I might add, by the way, when we talk about how we have uh, uh, benefited by what NASA did in the 1950s, that's true. We certainly are. This generation is benefiting directly from those technologies. I mean, the weather satellites that are up there and uh, uh, you, you name it, uh, we've, we've got some uh, things that uh, were, were, or are up there because the, the right rockets were developed by NASA a long time ago. But I don't believe that it was based on um, major increases in the debt that our country owed to other countries. I think that our people in the 1950s, the debt level was not expanding as it has in the last two decades. And we have got to make sure that we deal with that, or we, the people 20, 30 years from now won't be looking back and saying how wonderful it was. They're saying they probably are, the, they'll blame, be blaming us for some economic catastrophe like the devaluation of our currency. Um, so with that said, also let me note that I agree that uh, Mr. Barrera's uh, amendment is a, is, you know, it's going in the right direction in that it's, it's trying to be responsible and it's not uh, as big a, uh, a major new expenditure as we seem to be hearing being backed on the other side of the aisle. But let's work together on this. I mean, uh, I, uh, we're, gonna, we're opposing it now, but let, let me just give you a word. I'll work with you to find an offset that you may think it shouldn't be a priority for NASA as well. Let's find that area and finance those areas that you think are, are important here. And one last thing, I do support uh, the whole idea of, of space technology. And, and, and I've done it, you know, I, human, spa, human space exploration missions to Mars may be a little bit too expensive for us now, but certainly deep space exploration is something we can do now in a cost-effective way. Uh, we can, uh, I believe in space solar power development, for example. And um, I certainly uh, think that we need to handle what I consider to be the space infrastructure for other things that, need, that are being done. Like, for example, getting rid of space debris, which is, if we don't have that as a priority, all these other things could be wiped, wiped away because they, they'd be you know, shot out of the sky. So we've got uh, that and, uh, uh, and things that we can find, I believe, if we work together, a mutual priorities. But let's try to do that, and I'm willing to work with you on it. Thank you, but I oppose the amendment. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Warbacher. Uh The question is on the bearer amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. And opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. And, um, could I ask for a roll call? And a roll call vote has been requested pursuant to committee rule, rules. A recorded vote will be postponed. 
Uh, we will now go to an amendment to be offered by the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Grayson, and he is recognized for that purpose. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment. And the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 2039, <coughs> offered by Mr. Grayson of Florida. Page 127, after line 18. And Without Mr. objection, Powell. the amendment is considered as read, and the gentleman is recognized to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This amendment would require submission of the Kennedy Space Center and the Apollo 11 lunar landing site to the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, that is UNESCO, for designation as a World Heritage Site. According to UNESCO, World Heritage Sites must be of outstanding universal value and meet at least one of ten selection criteria, the first of which is to represent a masterpiece of human creative genius. Clearly, putting a man on the moon is a masterpiece of human creative genius. For that reason, I'd like for NASA, through the joint listing of the Kennedy Space Center and the Apollo 11 Lunar Landing Site, to receive the recognition it so justly deserves. The Statue of Liberty, Independence Hall, and you, the University of Virginia, jointly listed with Monticello, have a place on the World Heritage Site list already. And surely, then, the Kennedy Space Center, which has launched into space every astronaut who ever set, set foot on the moon, uh, deserves a place on that list as well. To be clear, this is not any assertion of U.S. or other nations' sovereignty over any part of the moon, uh, nor it is, it is an assertion of any property rights or alter any property rights uh, with regard to either of these two locations. It simply recognizes on a U.N. list uh, what we all recognize in our hearts, which is what an amazing accomplishment it was to send human beings to the moon. I urge my colleagues to support this uh, effort by voting for my amendment, and I yield the balance of my time. And thank you, Mr. Grayson. And the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Lucas, is recognized in opposition. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. After striking last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. I appreciate Mr. Grayson's amendment and his passion for protecting these extremely important historic sites. And I think it's a, a concern that I share with Mr. Grayson, uh, that we address these issues in the appropriate fashion. And I'd very enthusiastically like to work with in the future. But unfortunately, I believe at the present time in this piece of legislation, I must oppose that amendment. I think it runs contrary to some of the uh, bipartisan policy provisions that have been approved at different points by this committee and in the full house. But I do appreciate where he's coming from, being a child of the 60s who stayed up late into the night to watch that rather scratchy black and white television in 1969 and who watched uh, every coverage of every uh, rocket launch in the 60s and 70s. Uh, I share his points, but on this particular occasion, I must respectfully oppose this and ask my colleagues to uh, reject the gentleman's amendment. You go back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. Are there other members who wish to be heard on the amendment? The gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Johnson, is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm going to strike the last word. The gentlewoman is recognized for five minutes. I, I support Mr. Grayson's amendment. Uh, this amendment supplements the goals in Section 725 of this bill involving the protection of the Apollo landing sites. And while I believe that we should be careful as to what we submit to uh, UNESCO uh, in regards to the Kennedy Space Center, which is an active NASA launch facility, there's much merit to this proposal. I also believe that there is some legal groundwork that needs to be covered before we can implement this provision into law. For example, it is important to ensure that we stay within the bounds of our treaty obligations when carrying out this work. Uh, with that said, this is a good amendment and that pushes the discussion on this very important topic forward, and I urge my uh, colleagues to support this amendment. Will the gentlelady yield? Will the gentlelady uh, yield? I yield, Mr. Grayson. Thank you. Uh, it, it appears to me that Congressman Lucas and I are actually on the same wavelength here. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what he may be referring to, uh, and I'd like to learn more about it. Um, in, in that vein, uh, if I can have the gentleman's assurance that we'll work together to try to accomplish this goal of having some appropriate territory listed on the UNESCO uh, list, uh, then if, if I can have that assurance and I'll yield to him to respond, uh, then I'll withdraw the amendment. 
I would simply yield to the gentleman that the appropriate uh, designation and preservation, I agree with fully. How we get there, I'm not sure yet, but let's work on it. <laughs> okay. Well, with that in, in mind and with that assurance, I withdraw my amendment. Okay. With that objection, the amendment is withdrawn, and uh, I'll add my assurance as well to that, Mr. Grayson. Uh, Thank you, and I yield back. Oh, all that was under the tremendous time. Well, <laughs> free, free flow of information here. Uh, the uh, gentleman from California, Mr. Rohrbacher, is recognized. And uh, no. I have uh, decided not to uh, offer, your uh, offer my amendment. Okay. Thank I you. Very much appreciated. Uh, a vote on the floor is expected in the next five minutes. I, probably a procedural vote, unexpected. And uh, assuming that vote occurs, we will uh, postpone all recorded votes until immediately after that vote. So I'd like for everyone to return as soon as possible so we can have these votes. Now, uh, what happens if we don't have the procedural vote? Uh, we will, if we don't have the procedural vote, we'll pick up and roll the votes at 1 o'clock or uh, immediately after this vote, whichever occurs last. <laughs> And uh, we will stand in recess until that point. and Technology Committee will reconvene. Uh, we have a series of recorded votes. And uh, before we get to the votes, without objection, I'd like to put into the record uh, some letters of support that we have received, uh, one from the Coalition for Space Exploration, which is comprised of aerospace industry companies, said the bill, quote, reaffirms longstanding congressional support for NASA's exploration program, including the world's only super heavy exploration rocket, the Space Launch System, and Deep Space Crew Vehicle Orion. Using these exceptional and unparalleled exploration systems, NASA will soon return American astronauts to cislunar space for the first time in more than 40 years and eventually take us to Mars with suppliers across 48 states providing components for SLS and Orion communities across the nation are all a part of returning American astronauts to deep space. And from the Commercial Space Flight Federation, uh, which represents more than 50 commercial space companies across the United States, also expressed its strong support for the bill, citing, quote, the committee's increased support for the commercial crew program and the bill's ability to restore America's capability to launch American astronauts on American rockets from American soil by 2017 and end our sole reliance on Russia. And in a letter from the Planetary Society Director of Advocacy, Casey Dreyer, praised the committee's, quote, scientifically ambitious, affordable plan of solar system exploration, as well as the bill's clear directives and support for NASA's future exploration. Now, the Planetary Society, led by CEO Bill Nye, is considered one of the largest and most influential public space organizations in the world. The first question is on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Johnson, and the clerk will call the rule. Mr. Smith. No. Mr. Smith votes no. Mr. Lucas. No. Mr. Lucas votes no. Mr. Sensenbrenner. Mr. Rohrabacher. Mr. Rohrabacher votes no. Mr. Nagabauer. No. Mr. Nagabauer votes no. Mr. McCall. No. Mr. McCall votes no. Mr. Plazo. No. Mr. Plazo votes no. Mr. Brooks. Mr. Brooks votes no. Mr. Holkgren. No. Mr. Holkgren votes no. Mr. Posey. Mr. Posey votes no. Mr. Massey. Mr. Bridenstine. Mr. Bridenstine votes no. Mr. Weber. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson votes no. Mr. Molinar. Mr. Molinar votes no. Mr. Knight. Mr. Knight votes no. Mr. Babin. Mr. Babin votes no. Mr. Westerman. Mr. Westerman votes no. Mrs. Comstock. Mrs. Comstock votes no. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Palmer. Mr. Palmer votes no. Mr. Laddermilk. Mr. Laddermilk votes no. Ms. Johnson. Ms. Johnson votes aye. Ms. Lofgren. Mr. Lipinski. 
Mr. Lipinski votes aye. Ms. Edwards? Aye. Ms. Edwards votes aye. Ms. Bonamici? Aye. Ms. Bonamici votes aye. Mr. Swalwell? Aye. Mr. Swalwell votes aye. Mr. Grayson? Aye. Mr. Grayson votes aye. Mr. Barra? Ms. Esty? Aye. Ms. Esty votes aye. Mr. Vesey? Aye. Mr. Vesey <laughs> votes aye. Ms. Clark? Aye. Ms. Clark votes aye. Mr. Byer? Aye. Mr. Byer votes aye. Mr. Perlmutter? Aye. Mr. Perlmutter votes aye. Mr. Tonko? Aye. Mr. Tonko votes aye. Mr. Tacano? Mr. Foster? Aye. Mr. Foster votes aye. And the clerk will report the vote. Mr. Chairman, 13 members have voted aye. 18 members have voted nay. And the amendment is not adopted. Uh, the question is on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from Maryland, Ms. Edwards, and the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Smith? No. Mr. Smith votes no. Mr. Lucas? No. Mr. Lucas votes no. Mr. Sensenbrenner? Mr. Rohrabacher? No. Mr. Rohrabacher votes no. Mr. Nagebauer? No. Mr. Nagebauer votes no. Mr. McCall? No. Mr. McCall votes no. Mr. Plazo? No. Mr. Plazo votes no. Mr. Brooks? No. Mr. Brooks votes no. Mr. Holtgren? No. Mr. Holtgren votes no. Mr. Posey? No. Mr. Posey votes no. Mr. Massey? Mr. Bridenstine. No. Mr. Bridenstine votes no. Mr. Weber. Mr. Johnson. No. Mr. Johnson votes no. Mr. Molinar. No. Mr. Molinar votes no. Mr. Knight. No. Mr. Knight votes no. Mr. Babin. No. Mr. Babin votes no. Mr. Westerman. No. Mr. Westerman votes no. Mrs. Comstock. No. Mrs. Comstock votes no. Mr. Newhouse. No. Mr. Palmer. No. Mr. Palmer votes no. Mr. Laddermilk. Mr. Laddermilk votes no. Ms. Johnson? Aye. Ms. Johnson votes aye. Ms. Lofgren? Mr. Lipinski? Aye. Mr. Lipinski votes aye. Ms. Edwards? Aye. Ms. Edwards votes aye. Ms. Bonamici? Aye. Ms. Bonamici votes aye. Mr. Swalwell? Aye. Mr. Swalwell votes aye. Mr. Grayson? Aye. Mr. Grayson votes aye. Mr. Barra? Aye. Mr. Barra votes aye. Ms. Esty? Aye. Ms. Esty votes aye. Mr. Vesey? Mr. VC votes aye. Ms. Clark? Ms. Clark votes aye. Mr. Byer? Mr. Byer votes aye. Mr. Perlmutter? Mr. Perlmutter votes aye. Mr. Tonko? Mr. Tonko votes aye. Mr. Tacano? Mr. Foster? Mr. Foster votes aye. Kirk will report the vote. Mr. Chairman, 14 members have voted aye, 18 members have voted nay. Uh, the amendment is not adopted, and the next question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Byer, and the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Smith? No. Mr. Smith votes no. Mr. Lucas? No. Mr. Lucas votes no. Mr. Sensenbrenner? Mr. Rohrabacher? No. Mr. Rohrabacher votes no. Mr. Nagebauer? No. Mr. Nagebauer votes no. Mr. McCall? Mr. McCall votes no. Mr. Plaza? <clears throat> Mr. Plaza votes no. Mr. Brooks? No. Mr. Brooks votes no. Mr. Holtgren? No. Mr. Holtgren votes no. Mr. Posey? No. Mr. Posey votes no. Mr. Massey? No. Mr. Bridenstine? No. Mr. Bridenstine votes no. Mr. Weber? Mr. Johnson? No. Mr. Johnson votes no. Mr. Molinar? No. Mr. Molinar votes no. Mr. Knight? No. Mr. Knight votes no. Mr. Babin? No. Mr. Babin votes no. Mr. Westerman? No. Mr. Westerman votes no. Mrs. Comstock? No. Mrs. Comstock votes no. Mr. Newhouse? No. Mr. Palmer? No. Mr. Palmer votes no. Mr. Laddermilk? No. Mr. Laddermilk votes no. Ms. Johnson? Aye. Ms. Johnson votes aye. Ms. Lofgren? No. Mr. Lipinski? No. Mr. Lipinski votes aye. Ms. Edwards? No. Ms. Edwards votes aye. Ms. Bonamici? No. Ms. Bonamici votes aye. Mr. Swalwell? Mr. Swalwell votes aye. Mr. Grayson? Aye. Mr. Grayson votes aye. Mr. Barra? Aye. Mr. Barra <laughs> votes aye. Ms. Esty? Ms. Esty votes aye. Mr. Vesey? Aye. Mr. Vesey votes aye. Ms. Clark? Ms. Clark votes aye. Mr. Byer? Aye. Mr. Byer votes aye. Mr. Perlmutter? Aye. Mr. Perlmutter <laughs> votes aye. Mr. Tonko? Aye. Mr. Tonko votes aye. Mr. Tacano? Mr. Foster? Aye. Mr. Foster votes aye. <coughs> Clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, 14 members voted aye, 18 members voted nay. Okay, and the amendment is not adopted. Uh, the question is now on the amendment offered by the gentleman from California, Mr. Barra. The clerk will call the roll. 
Mr. Smith? No. Mr. Smith votes no. Mr. Lucas? No. Mr. Lucas votes no. Mr. Sensenbrenner? Mr. Rohrabacher? Mr. Rohrabacher votes no. Mr. Nagebauer? Mr. Nagebauer votes no. Mr. McCall? No. Mr. McCall votes no. Mr. Plazo? Mr. Plazo votes no. Mr. Brooks? No. Mr. Brooks votes no. Mr. Holkren? No. Mr. Holkren votes no. Mr. Posey? Mr. Posey votes no. Mr. Massey? Mr. Bridenstein? Mr. Bridenstine votes no. Mr. Weber? Mr. Johnson? No. Mr. Johnson votes no. Mr. Molinar? No. Mr. Molinar votes no. Mr. Knight? No. Mr. Knight votes no. Mr. Babin? No. Mr. Babin votes no. Mr. Westerman? Yes. Mr. Westerman votes no. Mrs. Comstock? Mrs. Comstock votes no. Mr. Newhouse? No. Mr. Palmer? No. Mr. Palmer votes no. Mr. Laddermilk? No. Mr. Laddermilk votes no. Ms. Johnson? Ms. Johnson votes aye. Ms. Lofgren? Mr. Lipinski? Aye. Mr. Lipinski votes aye. Ms. Edwards? Aye. Ms. Edwards votes aye. Ms. Bonamici? Aye. Ms. Bonamici votes aye. Mr. Swalwell? Aye. Mr. Swalwell votes aye. Mr. Grayson? Aye. Mr. Grayson votes aye. Mr. Barra? Aye. Mr. Barra votes aye. Ms. Esty? Aye. Ms. Esty votes aye. Mr. Vesey? Aye. Mr. Vesey votes aye. Ms. Clark? Aye. Ms. Clark votes aye. Mr. Byer? Mr. Byer votes aye. Mr. Perlmutter. Aye. Mr. Perlmutter votes aye. Mr. Tonko. Aye. Mr. Tonko votes aye. Mr. Tacano. Mr. Foster. Mr. Foster votes aye. Mr. Weber. No. Mr. Weber votes no. And the clerk will report the vote. Mr. Chairman, 14 members have voted aye. 19 members have voted nay. The amendment is not adopted. Reporting quorum being present, I move that the Committee on Science, Space, and Technology report. Mr. Chairman. Uh, who, who seeks recognition? The Mr. gentleman from California, Mr. Bear. Mr. Chairman, I was um, detained, unfortunately, and, and was not able to get here for the um, first vote. And I'd ask unanimous consent if we could record an aye vote for the amendment in the nature of the substitute by Ms. Johnson for the first vote. If the record reflect that. Uh, with that objection, that will be reflected in the record. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I move that the committee. Mr. Chairman, who seeks recognition? I do over here. Uh, the gentleman from Texas. I, I Mr. seek unanimous uh, uh, um, consent to cancel out his vote. <laughs> <laughs> we will look at the record and uh, put you I down as no <laughs> on, on the relevant amendments, and the uh, record will reflect that. I move that the Committee on the Science, Space, and Technology report H.R. 2039 to the House with the recommendation that the bill do pass. And the question is on favorably reporting H.R. 2039 to the House. All those in favor say aye. Uh, opposed, no. Uh, the ayes have it. And the bill is ordered reported favorably. A recorded vote has been requested, and a recorded vote will be held. And the clerk will call, will report the vote. Mr. Smith. Aye. Mr. Smith votes aye. Mr. Lucas. Aye. Mr. Lucas votes aye. Mr. Sensenbrenner. Mr. Rohrabacher. Yeah. Mr. Rohrabacher votes aye. Mr. Nagebauer. Mr. Nagebauer votes aye. Mr. McCall. Aye. Mr. McCall votes aye. Mr. Plazo. Aye. Mr. Plazo votes aye. Mr. Brooks. Aye. Mr. Brooks votes aye. Mr. Holtgren. Mr. Holtgren votes aye. Mr. Posey. Mr. Posey votes aye. Mr. Massey. Mr. Bridenstine. Mr. Bridenstine votes aye. Mr. Weber. Aye. Mr. Weber votes aye. Mr. Johnson. Aye. Mr. Johnson votes aye. Mr. Molinar. Mr. Molinar votes aye. Mr. Knight. Aye. Mr. Knight votes aye. Mr. Babin. Aye. Mr. Babin votes aye. Mr. Westerman. Aye. Mr. Westerman votes aye. Mrs. Comstock. Aye. Mrs. Comstock votes aye. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Palmer. Aye. Mr. Palmer votes aye. Mr. Laddermilk. Aye. Mr. Laddermilk votes aye. Ms. Johnson. Ms. Johnson votes nay. Ms. Lofgren. Ms. Lofgren votes nay. Mr. Lipinski. Mr. Lipinski votes nay. Ms. Edwards. Ms. Edwards votes nay. Ms. Bonamici. Ms. Bonamici, Bonamici votes nay. Mr. Swalwell. No. Mr. Swalwell votes nay. Mr. Grayson. No. Mr. Grayson votes nay. Mr. Barra. No. Mr. Barra votes nay. Ms. Esty. Ms. Esty votes nay. Mr. Vesey. Mr. Vesey <coughs> votes nay. Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark votes nay. Mr. Byer. Mr. Byer votes nay. Mr. Perlmutter. 
Mr. Perlmutter votes nay. Mr. Tonko. Nay. Mr. Tonko votes nay. Mr. Tocano. Mr. Foster. Mr. Foster votes nay. And the clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, 19 members voted aye, 15 members voted nay. And the but, ayes have it, and the bill is reported Mr. favorably. Chairman, uh, the gentlewoman from California. I would ask unanimous consent that my, yeah, had I been present and not unavoidably uh, detained, I would have voted yes on the amendments, and if that could okay. be noted at the appropriate uh, Without objection, that will be reflected in the record. Uh, without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table, and H.R. 2039 is ordered reported to the House. I ask unanimous consent that the staff be authorized to make any necessary technical and conforming changes. Uh, without objection, so ordered. Now, we had great attendance today. I thank all members for being here, and we stand adjourned. <laughs>